Ryan, Kyle, please start. Hi, everybody. Good day. I'm Kyle Ellicott, your host for another edition of BCTV, tuning in from around the world with outstanding speakers to talk to you today about another subject, one we haven't covered yet here on BCTV, but is very, very fundamental not just what's happening in the world in general, but also with all the technologies that we have been speaking about. So whether that's artificial intelligence, that's been blockchain, fintech, machine learning, and beyond. All of these various technologies play a role in the future of the industries we're gonna be talking about that today, and that's advertising and digital media. For those that are maybe unfamiliar, the bigger, more macro picture around publishing and digital media and or media in general is these industries have typically been very slow to innovate. They've been very well-established businesses that have provided us a lot, but very slow movers around digitization. However, that is now changing as consumer behaviors have changed, how we are engaging, where we're engaging, and also from a corporate side, where and how we're looking at the future of advertising. And so I'm joined with some of the greatest minds in the space today, representing all sides of the table, publishing, venture, writing, and advertising to share with us what's happening in this space so you, either investors, entrepreneurs, and our general audience can understand how to navigate this space and where to lay your bets building and investing in this space. And as always, a big thank you to our audience for joining in at any point today. If you have questions, comments, feel free to drop them in the chat box on that side. Uh, do click the thumbs up if you like what we're saying and the subscribe to see more BCTV every day and us here as well. And a thank you to Elena and to the entire LA Token team for bringing us all together today and every day for BCTV. Now, without further ado, I'll stop talking and introduce our panelists. Uh, and so just like every episode, we will go Brady Bunch style. Jonathan, welcome back to the show. Uh, if you could, a quick introduction and a little background on how you got into uh, this space as well. Oh, and you're on mute, so yep. there you go. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Kyle. As far as just a brief background, I was originally going to go for computer science and uh, media writing. Anything to do with that would have been the furthest thing from my future plans, but I was trading stocks when I was 15, ended up working with a corporate communications firm um, because of my interest in one of their newsletters. And I, I mean, it's such a long story, I'm trying to keep it short, but um, that's kind of how I fell into it. And I found that most people in this space don't really, or at least at the time, didn't really pay attention to the analytics. Now I don't think they have a choice, um, but having more of that math-based mindset uh, really helped everything click well for me and we experienced a lot of success along the way. Wonderful. Glad to have you back and excited to, to dive in. Might be pulling a little of your gaming uh, interest and experience into this panel, I feel, but uh, nonetheless, sure. excited to have you back. Julian, welcome from the other side of the pond. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you. Quick introduction as well and a little background on yourself and make sure you click that unmute button. Yes, thanks for the invitation. Great to join you. Uh, yeah, my background's uh, a, a long-term, what I would call product guy. <clears throat> Ten years at, at, at Apple in the um, mid-80s to late 90s, um, working with some great people and doing some fun things, advanced technology. A lot of the things that we now take for granted were pioneered then. Um, I then had a couple of my own startups. Um, uh, oh, sorry, AT&T first, built a smart card-based payment system predicting we'd all be downloading music files 10 years before the iPhone came out, so slightly too soon. Uh, uh, I then did a spell uh, uh, with my, a couple of my own startups, then eight years at Barclays, and I've just joined a startup again. So a long-term product guy. And although I'm not a um, media and advertising expert, the technology we are building today, we feel is uh, very relevant to solve a lot of the problems we perceive that industry faces. So I was keen to join on this topic. Wonderful. What's the startup? What, what are you guys working on? So in the UK, we've got a thing called open banking. What open banking means is non-banks can suddenly access financial transactions at a network level, assuming you have the consent, of course, of the account holder. 
Um, what we are is a startup that's got the regulatory authority to look at both the transactions and to effect payments. And what I'm doing is building a data layer on top of that. And what will, what, what will it do? It will enable people to assert things which they can evidence from a bank statement without saying who they are or giving any information about themselves whatsoever. So you can wow. think of it applying in lots of different areas from personal loyalty to lifetime value to process improvement. There's lots of ways it could play out. For those that are listening, we're gonna be talking a little bit more about this, not only today, but also tomorrow on BCTV as well. So Julian, I'm, I'm following that space very heavily myself and love uh, love that you went into that. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. I maybe Brian, should, maybe welcome. Should the, I should have checked the subject matter first before. No, no, this is this actually plays a very big role. So for, for, for those that are listening, finance and specifically open finance or fintech will yeah. broaden it even further, plays a very big role in the future of advertising and digital media. There is a huge fundamental layer that's being built or has been and very quietly being released. At this uh, at this injunction, so so Julian, you're you're in the right spot. Do not leave. You are in the right spot. Please stay. Um, it's harder to keep you here because it's digital. So you, you're not on the stage. You can't just walk up. You click a button. But stay. <laughs> we, we need your expertise. Ryan, welcome to the show. Uh, a pleasure to have you. Uh, same to you. Quick introduction and a little background on yourself. I I think there needs to be a whole show just about that picture behind Julian's head. I think I want to know behind that picture. Yes. That is, I was going to ask pre-show, what is that? We, we've already, we, Ryan already brought it up. So what is a it? Lovely, a, a, where I used to live in the East End, there was a lovely local artist. She made it and I just, uh, I like the colors. It, it terrifies my younger children, but I love it. Shameless plug. If you're in London, <laughs> look up Julian and go find that artist. All yeah. right, Ryan, to you, uh, intro and a little background. Yeah, pumped to be here. Uh, I, I saw the uh, the little banner that came over promoting the show and it said Forbes under my name, which I'm a Forbes contributor technically, but the way that I got to Forbes as a contributor um, is by, by building a business that, that uh, helps brands sell products on Amazon. Um, and so we've been doing that for about 10 years, started the business about seven years ago, exited the business three years ago to a, a very large um, brokerage here in the United States that helps brands put products on the shelves of some of the largest retail chains. And so we sort of are a digital extension to what they do. Um, and so, as you can imagine, selling products on Amazon over the last uh, four or five months has been tremendously uh, different than it was up until this point. And so very excited to be here. Advertising shifted quite a bit as well. So pumped to, uh, to share some insights. Absolutely. And there's, we've been talking on previous episodes around the future of e-commerce and marketplaces and how that entire world has changed almost overnight, including with its logistics and how that's just looking as our new future going ahead, as yeah. most of us are not heading into stores right now. So very excited to unpack that as well. We've got, for those that are paying attention, we've got gaming. I'll call Jonathan out because he's got a lot of experience in that. We've got open banking and finance we and product. And now we have public publishing along with commerce and advertising. And then last but not least, Radhika, welcome to the show. Make sure you unmute yourself. Quick introduction, a little background on, uh, on yourself as well. Hello. Hi, thanks for inviting me for the show. Uh, mm -hmm. I head the business development for uh, Times of India, which is one of the largest media houses in India. Uh, it's a 175-year-old media house, but uh, it has diversified into print, radio, out of uh, OH, uh, into commerce, into dining out, um, into uh, games, online gaming, into OTT and entertainment. So it has a whole gamut of uh, everything that touches digital media. And along with it, it has invested and it has its own... Uh, I won't say VC arm, but a small angel investing arm, which invests in digital businesses in India and even abroad. And it is also has this real estate portal. So pretty much uh, covers the entire uh, gamut of offering in the digital space. I am a part of a very small part of that huge business. I am a part of the news business. And within news business also, I look at business development through partnerships and help increase the monetization of the news content. 
uh, that's primarily with, with uh, through partnerships with uh, news aggregators oems uh, even other apps affiliate marketing so all sorts of ways to increase the money monetization besides ad revenue uh before i've been in media space for last 6 years and before that i was uh, for 6 years i worked with telecom again airtel which is one of the largest telecom companies in india and uh, and i've spent some time with it i'm a coder myself with hewlett packard and all uh i'm a chemical engineer by degree but uh, haven't spent any time in uh, engineering i spent most of time in my digital media and telecom yeah Ooh. What haven't you done? This is phenomenal. What a background! Uh, this is this is pretty amazing. We're excited to have you on the show, and and I hope at some point we can touch on all of that background because it's a phenomenal uh, resume you've been able to build over the years. So congratulations! And last but not least, yet again, we have an, another guest that just joined us, a Linwood. Welcome to the show. Uh, if you could, uh, just a quick introduction, a little background on yourself and the company. Make sure you unmute yourself. as well. There we go. There we go. Uh um thanks for having me on. Uh my name is uh Linwood Bivens, CEO of Reach TV. Uh Reach TV is a I'll start from there. Is a um we started about 4 years ago. We launched building a with a goal of building a NN platform that delivers content um into a target audience. Um the audience we were looking for was affluent um different types of people that we really wanted to target and we wanted to program content that was breaking the traditional television format but still delivering it to television screens um we built our platform um sorry about that a call came in uh we built our platform um and filed two different patents on the delivery and the reporting and pulling uh we ended up launching in January 17 um We are now in in three airports to start. We looked at airports as the one that that had that demographic that we wanted to acquire, and now we're in ninety airports in the U.S., Canada, U.K., uh, Virgin Atlantic lounges, and um, we are Nielsen rated network. Um, obviously, with the, what's going on in the world, it, obviously the the numbers are a little bit down than what they were, but the idea is that we do about six shows per hour, over one hundred eight shows per day. Um, and with even with the covid numbers if you want to come coming out of it uh we're going to have 150 billion network impressions per year and over 5 billion ad impressions per year um so that was what we really wanted to build was a network uh that allowed creatives to be able to talk directly to the consumer and to the viewer and that we can build content contextually to that to that person um my background in before that to give you a quick update is i started in uh consumer electronics and computers direct to consumer um doing trade shows mail order uh magazine companies um and then transition to b2b um both on um uh using trade shows and and directly on as a wholesale reverse logistics and quickly saw that there was an opportunity starting in 96 I launched my first internet b2c company um which was we did six deals a day kind of sound familiar now but in 96 nobody knew what the hell we were talking about um within 3 years we grew to 40 million dollars a year and we were and we were uh, our biggest supplier and I com- we combined in 98 and in 99 we sold the company uh in 2000 i decided to we decided to revamp our b2b and we grew that in 4 years to 250 million dollars a year run rate um so i really understood and came from uh manufacturers um magazine companies that are now all the bigger media companies so the transition was uh sitting on one side of the table with them now I'm sitting on the other side of the table but it's the same uh relationships and brands that have been what I've been working with since my entire career uh, and so i think there's an intersection moving forward of content content and revenue and i think my our philosophy is that content drives commerce and so if you look at it that way and the way to engage a customer or engage a viewer our tagline is great stories within reach right um and so that's that's our focus and uh you know it's my quick recap of who, you know who i am and and what we're doing 
No, it's great. It's uh, thank you very much. I, I I think we we all very much agree, and you know, it kind of kicks us off on on where to begin. Is um, you know, great stories within reach. Uh, however, things have dramatically changed over the past six months, and in some cases longer, and um, will probably be forever changed or changed for quite some time. And so, when looking at the advertising and just digital media space in general. What is the current state? You know, what has has changed or has not uh, changed? And Linwood, let's start with you. I mean, you're you, you went from being in airports to airports not really uh, having any traffic. So, in your opinion, what's changed in these areas, and, and maybe for the better or for the worst? Well, well, you know, from for us, you know, we went from you know uh, on average about two and a half million, two over two million people a day. Um, you know, going through our airports to going down to 100,000. So, you know, it was a dramatic change on that side of the business. Um, but what, what we decided to do in this transition was to fix everything on a tech stack and really uh, lean in to our brands, our partners, and understand what their goals were coming out of this and how we could all um, really tell uh, a story together on the way out. So we focused on... Um, featuring and spotlighting what our customers are doing. And we had started about 18 months ago trying to follow where our viewer goes when they're not in the airport. And one of the things we found was they are on Facebook and Instagram because a little bit older, but they're also on fan pages of some of the celebrities and influencers that we know. So we started creating about, a, about 18 months ago with three, fa three celebrities, uh, Bam Majera, Aldaya Rose, and uh, who's our other start? But anyways, that was about 30 million fans. Fast forward to today, we have 64 uh, celebrity slash influencers and over 355 million fans. And last month we did 1.5 billion video views. So we transitioned our customers into story to our, our advertisers into storytellers. And we really told stories on these fan pages directly to that same viewer. So we were able to, while we were, you know, airports are starting to come back yesterday. You know, this week we finally hit 20% of last year. Uh, and I think we'll hit 35 in July. But we've also been able to help those brands tell stories, even when their money isn't there. Because now we're to, we've built a story together with them. So I think that's how we've dealt with it, is focusing on what can we do now so that when, this, when dollars come back, we're, we're positioned and our, and our advertisers look at us as a partner, not a platform. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that's something that will go? People will change to. Do you think your advertisers will want to stay story storytellers, or do you think they'll go back into their traditional ways? I think they were always storytellers. I think if you if you give me more time, you know, I'll tell you a longer story. And I think uh, people that make commercials are amazing. I don't know how they're able to do a story in thirty seconds. You know, as a, as a producer too, it's hard, right? And I think that brands spend a lot of money um, telling stories that nobody sees. Right. Um, and <clears throat> I'm not going to pick on him, but I remember being at Starbucks and they had these great stories. I have a military family that I have and my son's in Kuwait right now. Um, having a family that's a military, the stories were like five minutes long and they were absolutely beautiful. But when they cut them to do the ads, they were 30 seconds and it looked like they were just saying they hire veterans. That's not what the story was. The story was they hire not only veterans, but their families, their spouses, and they have an education program, a transition program, and it came to you beautifully in these five minute films, but there's nowhere to put that. Mm -hmm. Like who goes, I drink Starbucks every day. Who goes to starbucks.com? Nobody, right? So <laughs> that was the, I think what happens is we're helping brands be able to tell those stories and packaging it as both content and ad instead of just an ad, which is a 30 second ad. I, I, I like that. I see Ryan and Radhika both shaking their heads as well. Radhika, I want to come to you. I mean, you're a part of this conglomerate and you work in terms of media, right? You guys are in so many buckets beyond media, uh, which is ex exciting, but you also work with a lot of these uh, partners, right? And, and driving affiliate advertising. What are you seeing change? And a second part of that, which we'll come back to is, you know, are you seeing a similar trend to Linwood as well? But overall, what are you seeing change and shift in your world? I'm, you're on mute, just to let you know. No so worries. I, I'm going to do it at least two more times. Don't worry. I'm going to totally mess it up too. So you're fine. Okay. 
I will tell specifically about India because uh, though we uh, uh, we have a huge uh, uh, number of people, internet users, etc. But in India, the print print media is still growing. TV is still large and radio is still significant. Uh, but with this COVID, a lot of things changed. Now, print media revenue, which was the growth rate had slowed down, but it was still growing. It suddenly deaccelerated because people had fears around the uh, usage of newspaper, etc. Lockdowns happened all over the world, which led to the huge spurt in uh, growth spurt in our traffic in our digital media. Uh, that helped. Oh, but obviously, we have a print media arm as well as digital media, and the loss in revenue in the print was not completely compensated uh, on the digital. But we suddenly see, saw huge growth in uh, the users, the page views, the engagement across all platforms, across news media, across OTT, across uh, lifestyle, and all, all, all businesses. Uh, the challenge which we faced, obviously, because we uh, we gained the revenue from advertisers and the, they were real industries, whether it's entertainment or it's dining, etc. They, uh, they were suddenly due to the lockdown and even the lockdown continues to happen in India uh, with some relaxation. These industries are facing a loss in their revenue. So our ECPMs have dropped. And obviously, since the revenue collections are also facing, uh, we are facing issues in collections, but we are still growing because uh, a lot of people who used to go to malls, etc., to shop now are shopping more on internet. So suddenly, the economy has shifted a lot to internet. I wouldn't say it is com completely. Uh, even uh, for example, tell uh, the growth in OTT. I mean, uh, a lot of OTT subscribers, like you know, you have Netflix uh, on Hot Disney, etc., which are global ones. But there are a lot of homegrown. Around 25 OTT players exist in India. Uh, they have seen a huge seven times, eight times growth in users and even subscriptions. Um, so, so that number has continued to increase. Even online gaming, uh, we have a lot of online gaming apps also. The casual gaming apps started seeing a growth in the number of users as well as the time spent. Then there are certain gaming apps like fantasy games where we invest, but they saw a dip in the revenue because all the sports events are canceled. We have, I mean, India is a country with a lot of cricket fans. Uh, we have a lot of cricket, sports and IPL, etc. that happen in India and they did not happen. So the fantasy games saw a drop in their revenue. So uh, depending upon the categories, uh, uh, the revenue went up and down. So this is what we have been seeing uh, in this market. And, uh, and I, as I see that this trend will continue in Q2, Q3 also, but uh, because of this, people have started looking for more ways to make revenue. I mean, a lot of people are going into partnerships. For example, uh, we have an OTT music, we have an OTT app as well as a music app, which is an equivalent of Spotify. We call it Ghana. It's the largest music app in India. Uh, they partnered with an education, online education app uh, to show, do a lot more podcasts, etc., to get additional users and revenue. Uh, similarly, uh, people are using, I mean, we have partnered with, say, handset manufacturers to have news content on their lock screen to drive more and more uh, additional revenue. So we are trying to catch the user wherever they go because we know that, um, uh, uh, that uh, I mean, obviously the spendings will be down because as such, the economy is not doing well, but we're trying to get more and more user engagement uh, through different means possible. I Sounds like you have all of them covered. I'm not sure if you're missing any, um, but uh, I, I like the fact that you guys are getting into uh, podcasts. I think what you're seeing in fantasy, I think we would all kind of agree, right? But in gaming, uh, a quick question on that. Is this, are you seeing some of your, your partners and advertisers want to jump into advertising on the games or is it more just users um, being more active and playing games? So, EC, uh, so India in India in general, ECPMs are lower compared to say US and Europe. So mm -hmm. we have to anything that happens, we have to any product we build or anything has to be scalable. And we talk about, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, we have uh, 65 billion page views uh, in a month. So the numbers are huge because uh, we are <laughs> we are 1.3 billion people, right? But the ECPMs are lower. So for any product, uh, obviously the growth that is happening is largely in, in terms of users, uh, but um, 
depending upon the game so we have some traditional games which were very popular in families and they were mostly board games like ludo etc which were very popular in india now due to people being confined in their homes and even families are not able to me so do they transfer that those games to online with some in app purchases they have seen some growth in their revenue but advertising revenue might depends so like ott has, ott players have seen a growth in their advertising revenue not everybody in gaming uh, might have seen growth in advertising revenue but yes they have seen some growth increase in in app purchases because uh, even though the disposable income has reduced people have no avenues to spend also is the same thing like suddenly uh, you know gym equipments and cycles have started selling in india more than you because the people don't have any other place to spend the money so uh, yeah some uh, increase in revenue has been seen how long will this have uh, is this sustainable or will this happen for over a long period of time we are yet to see yeah one of the use cases here in the states uh, we saw um, house party uh, an app that uh, had more or less been shut down um, or, or kind of acquired and then closed off all of a sudden came back and it became the biggest uh, gaming or interactive uh, tool that uh, was out there and even on the video side you know we saw uh, uh, TikTok and Triller and we saw uh, many other Spotify getting into this game as well and kind of readapting their business models not just here in the states but globally so I think you're, you're bringing up a very good point of topic we'll come back to but Jonathan I want to get your thoughts as well what's happening in all this space from your opinion what are you seeing what are you seeing change and shift around sure so the main thing that our investor brand network is focused on in terms of growth is podcasting. And I think that's something a lot of people kind of know about, but they don't really know what's going on right now. Um, obviously we're in stocks. So I just thought I'd pull up Spotify and they've doubled since COVID. And I mean, we're talking just a massive, massive market cap too. I think it was 50 billion if I remember right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just to kind of share some statistics and why advertisers really need to be looking at podcasting. Um, half the U.S. has listened to a podcast now, so that's a pretty substantial number. But 49% of the listing is done at home. And if you look at your average episode, 80% of them that tune in listen to most of it. And so when you have that kind of engagement, I don't really think you... Um, you know, should let that pass you by. I kind of look at it as social media, because if, if you remember, you know, back then, um, it wasn't very noisy environment, but there weren't that many players. Now we're seeing a lot of people buying mics to the point where you can even buy one if you want one. Webcams have even been hard to get here recently, or at least the good ones. Um, so I think that plays into our discussion here today. Yeah, I'd have to agree. I see Ryan shaking his head as well. I mean, podcasting, I think we would all agree. More or less, this is a podcast, right? We're a live show, but we can very quickly become a podcast in a matter of seconds. And you know, whether it be a Spotify, um, I'm an advisor to a company out of Asia that's focused around podcasting as well. And they've seen tremendous growth over the past, uh, past six to nine months. Uh, and it's just, it's a short form, right? We've got... Uh, applications to call them out because we are here on BC TV. You've got apps like Clubhouse uh, that was recently just funded by uh, Andreessen Horowitz and others for 10 plus million dollars. You've got um, many other audio based applications sprouting up left and right because audio is a great way to consume content. And it's, it's, uh, it's a desirable because you can do it while you're doing other things, right? It, traditional media was great holding that piece of paper was phenomenal and still is. But as we are on the move or as we're trying to multitask, those, those new mediums have become incredibly popular or shorter formed as well, right? As you look at uh, kind of audio books and where those are going. But Ryan, you're shaking your head left and right. I've been holding you off. And Julian, I'm coming to you last on product, so get ready. But Ryan, what are you seeing change in all this space as well? Not just from the podcasting side, but also just general advertising and, and I, things that we kind of talked a little bit about offline. Well, I'm, I'm definitely one of those people that listens to podcasts. And when I went for my run today, I wasn't planning on going for a long run. So I didn't bring my, my headphones to listen to, cause I listen to podcasts when I'm run, when I run and I generally listen to all the podcasts. I'm like, Oh man, he's like talking, he's totally talking about me. And then you go into the discussion of, well, it's a passive way to ingest content. And what we're seeing is this tremendous amount of influence that these hosts have can then leverage over to products, 
physical products that they can then sell, whether it be direct to consumer or through Amazon. And it gives them sort of, uh, you know, not an unfair advantage, but a tremendous advantage against anybody else who's trying to sell a tea or trying to sell a protein powder. Um, and I think if we look at it sort of like high level, one of my favorite sayings is, you know, you can't stop the waves, but you can learn to surf. And there were definitely some waves thrown at us uh, over the last six months. And if you look at the way that sort of Reach TV reacted to it or, or Times Internet, what's really cool is they can sort of test out new philosophies on how to best adapt to those waves at scale. And then they can make decisions fairly quickly because they already have the platform to sort of leverage. Um, and so what we saw sort of at scale was Amazon went out of stock. Um, well, grocery stores first went out and then Amazon went out because all that demand sort of shifted. And then all of these other sort of ancillary players in e-commerce, Google Shopping, you know, uh, Walmart.com, they all went out of stock. And so what we saw was this tremendous opportunity for other e-commerce channels to still thrive and realize that there's other players in the arena, even though our entire business is sort of focused around Amazon. And, you know, to me, it just sort of opens up, you know, all right, well, where are the channels? How do people want to get product? Or how do people, like right now, if they're not going through airports, they're still looking at screens. They're just looking at screens at home and they're looking at screens at a scale that we've never seen before. And I don't think they're gonna look at any less screens in the future. Okay, well, how do we then authentically tell a story to get a product in front of them and have them purchase that product? Um, it's just tremendous and podcasting's part of it. And I look at gaming and, and product placement and gaming or people doing live streams on Twitch because Again, everyone's at home watching TVs right now. And I just go back, I, it all, all roads come back to Amazon. I'm like, well, how do I get those people from Twitch to Amazon? How do I get them from podcast to Amazon? How do I get them from Reach TV to an influencer back to Amazon? Um, because that's just our little world we play in. Well, and, and it's 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 probably the wave of the future. So if you remember um, is it, uh, Alibaba and their singles day, um, or their big event, I think two years ago, they actually did a live fashion show. And during that live fashion show, as you watched it, you were actually able to purchase the products that were walking down the catwalk in real time. And they had it so that you could see them on screen and they would show kind of like the home shopping network uh, type view. So in the right hand side, um, I, I, I don't see why that's not something we would have, right? Uh, you know, here in the coming, I, I see you Linwood, don't worry, I'm, I'm coming back and Julian, I'm still coming to you, so don't worry. But in the near future, I mean, that is something we should have, right? Where you are viewing, you're being told a story and there is that opportunity to purchase the product right there. You are watching a game on Twitch owned by Amazon uh, and you're being shown the product. That's not just being yeah. advertised, but it's in the game. We're, I mean, the road doesn't stop. You could be buying digital assets at that point, right? You see a right. shield, you see clothing, you see gear. You should be able to buy that right through that value chain advertiser all the way back to the, uh, to the commerce. Yeah. I mean, it's sort of like advertisement. And uh, if you look at like HSN and, and QVC over the years, they've, they really have perfected it. And that's just going on at scale overseas, uh, you know, on, on Taobao, uh, the numbers that they can produce within five minutes of going live, because again, but it comes back to like, you have someone who has influence, somebody that people trust. And they're like, now buy this Mason jar and everyone buys this Mason jar. And so Amazon has, um, Amazon live right now. So if you go to their homepage or amazon.com slash live, they, they are doing these things. We're in the beta of it and we're testing things out. And, um, again, it's, it's, it's not the behavior that people ex like, it's not the path they normally are looking for when they're going to Amazon. Cause you're, you're sort of have a product in mind and you're going to search, but they are now doing like real programming. And, and, and during COVID they actually pulled back from hard selling and they started putting up content like, you know, get fit at home and cooking at home. And then they would layer like sort of organically marry in like, Oh, it's an Instapot that I'm cooking this in, or it's this spice packet that I'm cooking this in. And so I'm very bullish on live. I love live. I think it's with sports, you know, I, at, you know, it was like live news or that was it. And then yeah. I think we're starved for live content. Um, and I think people really like live content. There's an authenticity of live content. So I'm, I'm very bullish on, it. I think it is going to be a thing on Amazon. I do think it's going to take some time though. Wait, wait until we, uh, to Radika's point, wait until we uh, add live fantasy and gambling and so much more on top of that in it. Yeah. Get, get, we're, we'll come back. We'll come back. I've, I, Linwood, you had a, you had a comment. I want to make sure I get to that. And then Julian, I want to get your thoughts on all of this because from the product side, things are very different as we've all talked about. 
and would love to hear your thoughts along with where fintech is. So Linwood, uh, comments to what Ryan was mentioning. Well, um, uh, I'll, let me give you a brief 10 second. Uh, Ryan, I also uh, work with a company called Woot.com. Woot.com was the daily deal for Amazon. And what we did is hire Hollywood writers to write about computers and offerings every day and built a 7 million member community that that community would help drive us sales. It was such a big community that we were selling at, we were so trusted that we would put up a $99 brown bag and the, and the community trusted that we would deliver quality for that $99. <laughs> I was a purchaser of those. I don't, I don't remember what I got. <laughs> so that was a company, um, Partners in our Daryl Matt, we're all so super tight. And what we're doing right now is working on converting our our influencer network people into almost a lot Amazon Live, if you want to say. So we've we've have um, artificial intelligence and a patented technology that builds into our back end CMS that converts all of our content into um, taggable, like um, the the patent they have is like they have an NFL with John Madden used to write on the screen. That patented technology is in their platform and we've integrated that into any content we have. In a, in a matter of 60 seconds, I can tag it frame by frame, put infographics, shopability, everything. So we have that right this second. So the conversation where you're going on shopping is my future of where reach is going to be not only a content and a media network, but also a shopping platform. Um, and I'm looking for the partnerships of, and there's a product piece that needs to be in the middle of that somewhere, which is what you're talking about with Amazon live, but we have the audience, the people that can be the, you know, authentically in front of the camera and the opportunity, it just needs to connect the dots. And for me, COVID has created one word that I think is important collaboration. I've seen more collaboration during this period than I've seen in seven years. So that's excitement part for me. I've seen many companies come together and figure out how to fit that puzzle together. And that's where this call gets me excited. Super cool. I have to say one thing about Woot. So we, back in the day, this was like seven <laughs> years ago, we were launching our own products. We worked with a Woot influencer who would get our, our little deal upvoted. So get featured on the homepage and we'd, we'd sell it like a thousand units. Power of Woot, and to this day, Woot now is its own seller on Amazon. But I I've always admired Woot. Yeah, we were. We I were feel in, like there's we a were, future business uh, development relationship happening yeah. right here. So, yeah. Julian, I, I apologize for the delay, but I want to come to you. Where are we from your opinion on all of this? I mean, again, you focused on product. I wrote down your history even further. I mean, you've seen it all. You also started music downloading before Radika and her company were in it. So, what are you seeing? you know, shift and change in this entire space? Well, first of all, I'm so grateful you, um, you, you, you uh, spoke to me last. I've now been able to tune in to what the heck we're doing. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's actually been a brilliant segue into what, what, what I am thinking about, because what, what's been lovely about what everyone said, Ryan, Rad, Radke and um, uh, Kylie and everyone, is that, um, that they're talking about this, this view of a business, of its consumer. Whereas everything we are focused on is how does this person, this individual, the person to whom we want to sell or speak, how do they represent themselves in this network? And how, they, how, and how do they do that in this environment that we've got, as, as has been hinted at, where we've got a distrust of the primary social media and uh, uh, network platforms that we, are relied, that we rely upon, and, 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 and why we've also got to comply with this emerging and important legislation gdpr uh which 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 you know which, which aims to give us some degree of control over what information is revealed and how it's used so the, the product we are building is addressing the problem or, or the challenge or the opportunity of how do we allow an individual the person we want to buy something how do we allow them to represent themselves in any channel online, walking down the street, when within the boundaries of a geofence location, when scanning a QR code in, a, in, in an advert, when tapping an NFC billboard, how do we allow them to assert stuff? 
whilst remaining anonymous, but whilst, rely, whilst enabling the relying party to have confidence that this information is valuable. So bringing it down to the here and now, what, what, we, what, what we see as uh, the, the, the first, if you like, important deliverable for us is, as you know, we, the, the foundations of the company are about bank feeds. We can apply a simplified taxonomy to a bank feed and we can calculate how much you are worth to a supermarket or an airline or a restaurant or a bar or a what, whatever. And, um, and, and, and that information can be assertable, as I said, it's through any channel, online, offline, scanning, and advert, uh, walking down the street. And the relying party can then make a more informed judgment. And that information could be asserted as I said, when they're physically there, but also when they're engaging with an advert. This is why, why I wanted to join this stream. And it's where, it, it, in my heart, I always, I get goosebumps when I, when I have an idea and I know it's the right one. And I thought to myself, we ought to be able to inform the price paid for a programmatic advert. You know, I was very interested in the um, uh, stats that um, Linton spoke about, about his business. I, I love people on top of their business in terms of numbers. And we ought to be able to assert, because what Facebook and Google do today is they sell propensity. And arguably, Google's got the most customer segments in the world with three or four million. But that still puts us all in a group of thousands. With our technology, you are a segment of one at all times. And that information can be asserted whilst you remain anonymous. Um, relieving the relying party, the seller and the advertiser of any obligation whatsoever to consider or secure consent or permission. It's, it's explicit and implicit. It's a cryptographically secure proof with the provenance of that data associated with it. And so um, this is fascinating. I'm so happy. <laughs> I'm so happy you left me till last because now I was working out how to, how to introduce it. So, you know, what we aspire to be effectively is an, an ingredient, not a platform, an ingredient that could help the advertisers and the, uh, uh, the businesses make more informed decisions about how they acquire and retain and speak to people and, and value them. And um, just one very quick thing, and then I'll finish and hand over. Um, although the foundations today are financial data, there's absolutely nothing, uh, in fact, the very first version of the product will also include social media feeds you'll be able to assert your Instagram followers or your Facebook friends whilst remaining anonymous, whilst not allowing correlation between your Facebook or Instagram account. And, um, uh, and we will be able to evolve those things very quickly into um, uh, behavioral uh, 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 analytics. You know, uh, in fact, we can do that with bank data. You know, let's imagine, Kyle, you and I both spent a thousand pounds a month on a restaurant, but all yours went to one place. Mine went to 10. I get a promiscuous badge. You're a super loyal creature of habit. That massively impacts your predicted lifetime value. So this type of very simple data coming from banks, the, the, the data source that we, we most rely upon, the most trusted data source, we want to inform the way advertising works. That's a great point. And that's actually something, uh, funny enough, I just saw last night on Uber Eats, where there's now a loyalty score. So if you go to the same restaurant, I think it's X amount of time, we'll just say X amount of times, you become a loyal customer. And for being a loyal customer, you get rewarded for that versus spreading out, uh, which is I have a, a question. Of rewards. Yeah. I have a, I have a quick, quick question for, for Julian. Um, and it's, it's more on, on you're talking about walking down the street and going into places like i.e. an airport um when the, the ingredient you're talking about implementing will that be able to cum up 10 100 200 people in the same area and be able to pull in that data even though it's 200 people yeah, get yeah, 200 yeah. different you, you get where i'm going with that i do I, yeah absolutely let me give you an analogy because I, I i picked up on the fact that you worked in airlines so let me give let me apply everything i've said to an airline analogy Today, I'm loyal to BA, I have a BA card. With my world, I would accrue a value of how much I spent on airlines, on air tickets. And what the business, BA in this example, is paying for is, is a magic pair of glasses, effectively. They're paying for a magic pair of glasses. And when they put these glasses on, they can see the value of complete strangers. 
and they can see that value wherever they have configured what we call the trigger. The trigger could be a QR code, an NFC tap, or a geofence location. So I walk to, I, I, I'm loyal to BA, I'm in the concourse at Heathrow, Cafe Pacific say, send Mr. Wilson a VIP pass for the lounge and tell him there's a bottle of champagne waiting for him. We want to see him on us the next flight. Absolutely. You got it instantly. That's what it is. You, you, you suit. <laughs> I got, I got it. This is that's that's a great ingredient because there's companies right now uh, acquiring the data, and uh, we have a latitude and longitude, so I can tell whoever's in front of every single one of my screens at any time. And then we're getting that data, and then the question is, what do you do with it? How do you how do you apply that? And what yeah. you're talking about, that ingredient is what's missing. There's yeah. a contextualness that's missing. And one, one, one point of clarification, because underneath this is, is uh, you know, this is a modification of the crypto building blocks. It's, uh, it's leading edge, what's called zero knowledge proof cryptography. It's quite complex technically, but at a human level, it's very, it's lovely. It's wonderful because what we're doing that's different is you don't have to have acquired that individual. The data sits in my phone. If I switch it on and you've paid for that lens in your glasses, you can see it. You're not, you're not required to have had to acquire or secure consent and permission, et cetera. If I've switched it on, you can see it. That's awesome. This, this brings up a very exciting topic around data in general. You know, yesterday's show, we, we had an amazing quote of data is the new economy, uh, right? We've talked about it in previous episodes of data being the new oil, but at the end of the day, you still have to do something with it because we've also talked about how data is perishable which most people don't think about, right? Data does actually have a time limit. Just because you have a decade's worth of data doesn't necessarily mean it's valuable. And data can be time sensitive. So when we look at this industry of, we'll just call it digital media as a whole, how is data and analytics further playing a role in the future? And Julian, I'm going to hold on you because you just gave a little bit, but Radhika, I want to come to you. I mean, you guys are getting billions of page views. How are you thinking about data? How are you thinking about data privacy and, and that anonymous, how do we get uh, that anonymizing of the data so that you can provide maybe better content or better advertising in general as well? We are both on mute. You're, you're on mute there. Yeah, sorry. So, uh, so yes, we have around 67 billion page views and 550 million unique visitors in a month, and that's across all our platforms. Um, we obviously, from the anonymous anonymity perspective, we do compliance uh, comply with all the laws that are required in India as well as abroad, which is GDPR, etc. Because uh, I mean, there are a lot of visitors who come from abroad and visit us. Uh, in order to use that data, obviously, significantly for uh, better revenue for the organization, as well as the better uh, content for the user, we rely heavily on AI. So a lot of our products, uh, which is whether it's a news app, use algorithm for uh, showing relevant news along with the recency of the news. The, the product which we have called Ghana, uh, which is the equivalent of Spotify, also uses uh, AI to, del uh, it has a section called For You, depending upon what the user uses, uh, uh, kind of songs he listens, there are different segments of uh, music videos as, as well as music that is presented to him. Along with that, we have our own ad network also. Uh, so currently, uh, we have an ad network called Columbia Ad Network. And since we had the strength of so many users and page views, we have built it in parallel to the Google Ad Network, which we use uh, to deliver ads on all our platforms, both from the network as well as ad revenues. Our ad network is more on the side of performance, uh, performance ads, but uh, we definitely use the strength of both AI and the huge data to deliver uh, relevant ads as well as content to the user. Uh, one very interesting thing which we had done with the data also is so, so a lot of people, so as I said, I mean, Times of India website, the news website is a heavily, uh, I mean, we have a lot of users on that. And we noticed the kind of searches that are happening on our site. So one thing which we did with the site was we have created a page called most search products and most search uh, products. Uh, I mean, obviously we use the strength of our SEO also, 
and within that page itself the uh, regular ads are there but we have partnered with amazon and paytms etc i mean a local uh, guy is there to drive a lot of affiliate revenue from that page otherwise that traffic would have gone wasted because a lot of those queries are not news related queries also they could be lifestyle or people can be using for a cooking uh, a cooking batter or a device or a or a tool or something so we use that traffic to generate more revenue and meaningful through partnerships with e-commerce companies uh, we have another site called gadgets now which is all about mobile phones and gadgets etc again the entire revenue of that uh, site is driven uh, through the affiliate uh, ads affiliate uh, and the transaction based ads so yes here uh, the large size of the data that we have through so many users are used to generate meaningful content for the company as well as uh, revenue for the organization and, and and with some of those things mentioned i, I want to come back full circle to influencers so everyone has mentioned influencers in some way and um from those that I know that are influencers or those that have invested in influence-based businesses or are entrepreneurs looking to engage with influencers to sell products, it's all changed. It's all dramatically changed in the past six months from what I'm hearing. There's more content that's being created. There's more or less products. It's just very different. So Ryan, I want to start with you. How are you seeing kind of the influencer uh, network or the influencer game change from your perspective, because for the investors, investors are, are hearing from their entrepreneurs that they have an investor, they have an influencer network that's going to help them sell product. What does that actually mean going forward? For the entrepreneurs, they're looking to work with influencers to sell their product. So for our audience, how are you seeing this all change and, and maybe shift in some way? Yeah, I think I think it's a there's a lot to unpack there. But first mm -hmm. and foremost, you know, a lot of attention, even so by Amazon has been paid to influencers with their influencer program, which they set up, which is sort of like a, a 2.0 version of their affiliate program that's sort of catered more to like an influencer. Um, I think the challenge is, is that right now, the way that um, consumers normally ingest the content of an influencer isn't on Amazon, it's through Instagram or Facebook or wherever else that they are to drive them from there to Amazon, I think is the hurdle that they're going to have to go over. But I, the, the piece of it right now that I've seen a lot of, especially with products that have performed really well on Amazon is, oh, put on an influencer, put them behind the product, give them some skin in the game and, and they'll make it go. Um, I think the challenge to that is not all influencers are created equally. Um, I think influencers that have an audience that are on YouTube versus Insta versus Facebook, um, you know, even just on Facebook, if you have, you know, a ton of people that follow you, but you don't talk about anything health related and you launch a protein powder, it, it doesn't really matter if your, if your face is on it. And, it. and it really comes down to the engagement and, and really what are the types of products that you've historically promoted that, that do well, that you could put your brand on. And so I think that there's this learning curve that we're sort of going through, um, just because you have 50 million followers on Instagram it's not going to correlate over to a ton of sales if those followers aren't within the target market of the product that you released. And so I still am very bullish on influencers. I just think that it's just not as easy as saying, oh, we've got so-and-so on board. This thing's going to go big. It, there's so much, uh, so much deeper there, so much deeper layers. Yeah. Linwood, before you comment, the, the reason I want to come to you and Linwood, and I see Julian as well, is, is you, um, you had mentioned earlier about content. And, and same with Linwood, right? The storytelling aspect. There was a time when so-and-so told you to buy a product, you looked and you bought the product, right? You bought Jordan shoes because Jordan wore them. Now, uh, and I think again, Linwood started this as along with you, Ryan, is there has to be content around this. There has to be context around these, these types of product engagements, right? Just telling me to buy the Nike shoe doesn't work anymore, especially when I'm stuck at home and not wearing shoes. Uh, very much, right? So I think kind of what you guys were teeing up and Linwood, I, I know you're chomping the bit to get to this is yeah. storytelling, content creation has to be a part of it. So investors, if you're looking at this and you're talking to entrepreneurs who are saying, we've got an influencer network, don't ask how many followers they have because that's not the, always the answer. 42,000, 42 million, 67 billion. It doesn't necessarily equate to dollars sold. It's what are they doing? right? What are, what are, how are they engaging, right? Are they not just wearing their product because where, where are people out and about 
in fairness, but what are they telling the story? What is the context? I mean, Ryan, are, are you, are, do you agree that that content piece has to be a part of the puzzle? And Julian, I see you, don't, don't worry, I'm, I'm coming to you. I, I think it's so important. I think that there's different categories that lend themselves better. There's a gal on uh, YouTube that has a pretty tremendous following and she eats really spicy foods. And she launched a spice packet on, on Amazon and it instantly sold out. It didn't have like a good listing. It didn't have any of the things that you should do to structure your, your opportunity within Amazon properly, but it didn't matter because she had an audience and she put the perfect product in front of them. And then she probably talked about it on her channel. And so again, I think that there's just, there's, there's deeper layers there. And I think you're spot on. Yeah. It, it really is. It depends on yeah. what are they doing and listening. Linwood and, and then Julian. And I, I think the um, for one, I agree hundred percent with everything Ryan just said. And I'll, and I, I'll even take one step to unpack, to use the word unpack and define what an influencer is, right? Um, I look at someone who has influence on a, a group around them, but I, I kind of hate the word sometimes because it has a stereotype that it's an 18 year old or 20 something year old or whatever. But you look at an Isaac Mizrahi in this thing, you know, you, 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 he's become even more of a fashion brand icon, right? Because people are looking at her home and they're going back to the history and nostalgic. And now all of a sudden Isaac's brand has shot up across all different platforms and people are following and listening to his great stories of history. But I, and I'll give you an example of Bam Majera. Bam Majera was an awesome, you know, he was skateboarder. He's, you know, he's the, from Jackass, right? They tried to sell products with him that didn't match that. When we, we looked back and I started talking to the brands that really make sense, Element had a bunch of excess inventory because of the times we're in. And we were able to push that through BAM, which he was our first signed um, athlete because he was a skateboarder. They sold out every single piece inside of a week. Right? So that's the contextual with the right person, the right that represents the brand. And they both needed each other. And I think that's kind of where we're, you have to spend time with the, both the brand and the influencer to make sure that that fits. And then tell the story about where, if it's authentic. Ryan said it earlier, if you're going to go live, it's really authentic. And, and that's why people love it and follow it and buy it. And there's that, that two-way need for each yeah. other, which you bring up, right? Just because you're an influencer doesn't mean you're an influencer for brand A or product A versus product B. There has to be that need. And Ryan mentioned this earlier, is sort of Radhika is, is that, and, and Jonathan around podcasts is like, there, there has to be this two-way street, right? You have to build that, that context. And we talk about this here on BCTV quite often about the building of a relationship, right? Make sure there's an actual relationship take time to get to know each other, really build and grow that to make sure that it, uh, it's beneficial for all. And when it comes to influencers and brands and products, you have to have that. It's not just, I said it, so buy it. It has to be synonymous with each other. And, and Julian, anything to add? And Radhika, I saw you, so I'll come to, come to you next. Julian. Yeah, I think it's building on what uh, has already been said. Um, I wanted to stress two things. Uh, but the first has been mentioned, authenticity. You know, followers is a, is a very um, uh, flawed metric, a data point. And um, what's necessary is context, as you've already said as well. And th technologies like ours, you know, in, in, what a lot of people overlook is what GDPR, uh, well, what open banking will do to the banks, i.e. allow non-banks non to access the data, GDPR will do to Facebook and Google and Instagram and WhatsApp. And what do I mean by that? Well, whatever they can infer today will be inferable by a third party. You can democratize the whole Cambridge Analytica stuff. And that's precisely the focus we're taking, you know, uh, uh, but, 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 but doing it in a beautiful, open way. In other words, we'll say, according to your Facebook feed, you're a family guy, sporty guy, you're a party animal, whatever. But it's up to you whether you switch it on. The controls to switch it on are in your phone. If, if you do, it's visible. If you don't, it's not. And P.S., if you do switch it on, you're still anonymous anyway. Oh, and, and P.P.S., oh, and P.P.S., you earn money if someone looks at it. Hence, data is the new economy. 
from yeah, those except I want to yeah. update your analogy. I don't think we should use oil. More like the Tesla battery, I think. Very good. I appreciate the update. Tesla battery. There you go. Radhika, anything to add on that? Yeah, so about the influencer thing, so uh, I think there's a, I mean, uh, there are categories of influencers, like celebrities would be in category A, where there are millions of followers, but then there are micro influencers with say, 10,000, 50,000, 50K followers, etc. And I think they are, they do act a lot to influence the, their followers in terms of uh, you know product purchase because they do work hard or harder on the content compared to the larger celebrities uh, they have more uh, continuous time because they would post, say for a large celebrity might post say one post in three days four days or even a week and it'd be, it would be more talking about himself or herself but these smaller micro influencers do engage with their community more they are more reachable and so like, I, I'm not a part of a community, but there's a running community called Adidas Runners. I mean, there's a large group of uh, runners who, you know, do create, they have captain, coach, a lot of designations are given to them. They meet offline with their running group. They try to encourage a lot of people to run and, um, you know, they create content online during this COVID period. And a lot of people were locked inside their houses. They made sure that they have Facebook live sessions, Insta live sessions, you know, to continue to engage uh, their small set of followers. And I think in that way, those micro influence, whether it's for about running or it's about food, I think it's a lot of, I mean, nobody can influence more than three, four categories uh, to, uh, I mean, I personally feel, I mean, you can't be influencing people across categories to buy something. I think three or four categories is a big enough um, area for influencers to influence their followers and help them make purchase decisions. So I think micro influencers do play a very large role uh, and they're cheaper to acquire. They can be done with goodies versus celebrities who would demand money for it, right? So, money um, and or equity. That's what real, real quick, Lynn, would money and or equity. That's one thing people tend to forget. While influencers can be a great addition, you need to prepare accordingly. And that's why it goes back to that relationship, right? Just like taking money for entrepreneurs, just like taking money for an investor, when you bring on an influencer who may want equity, you want to make sure that there's a relationship. This is someone that's going to be a part of your company for a very long time, not for hopefully just a few minutes. You want them to be a part of that journey long term. As everyone is shaking their head in agreement, we've all been there. Trust us on, on this one as well. Jonathan, Lynn, would give me one second. Jonathan, I see you unmuted. Go ahead and anything to add on that. Sure. Yeah. Just before we switch to another subject, I, I wanted to make sure that those listening with interest you know, with influencers, obviously the way to be successful with any kind of digital marketing is to get in front of the same audience over and over again. And you don't always want to have the same message, but you do always want to have the same brand. And one of the ways to really maximize your opportunity, if you have multiple podcast hosts or multiple influencers or anything like that, take that back to your core audience or use press releases or other sponsored content um, providers or distribution services in order to show those people, hey, I must be pretty popular because every week I'm on another podcast. And it's kind of like the best way I can explain. I mean, I know everybody here gets it, but um, in case someone listening needs just a, another perspective, you know, if your brother or sister says, wow, I watched just such a great movie this weekend, you have to go see it. You, you might see it, you might not. But if your best friend tells you the same thing the next day, you're at Red Lobster and you hear about the table next to you talking about this movie, now you're going to see it. And, and that's really what we're talking about here. Make sure that you're taking it back to some core audience and show them all those different appearances. You got me thinking about those cheddar biscuits. Oh, man, that was a dangerous restaurant to mention. But Linwood, uh, you had a comment to add on that. Yeah, I, I was actually going to talk about our relationship with our influencers. It's a little bit unique. And I'll give you a 30-second. Um, we sit down with every single one. Uh, I'm not, we don't have a lot on purpose because we've picked who we wanted based on following the data of who we, our core audience is. And why I say that is we have direct access to their social. Right now, I can take a picture of us and post it. I would never do that, but I'm saying I could do, that's how much access and control we have. And it's important because it said something that Radhika said about uh, a celebrity might not do this or may not do that. Our relationship is a partnership in which we are able, we're basically take, looking at their fan pages 
as a channel and we're programming it like a television, like a network. And we're programming it from an authentic standpoint. So we're bringing over content that matches what they're doing and it's professionally produced along in between their own personal post. So it allows for an organic, organic and engaging interaction on their pages that's continual. As, as you just said, it's a continuous conversation that's happening daily, weekly, monthly, and then it builds trust. And then from that trust, you're able to sell. And that's kind of how we've built that over the last 18 months. Key word being organic, right? It's not it's all not organic. Just, right? all organic. It's, it's natural and free flowing, which to Ryan's point made earlier is we're, we're on so many devices. We're consuming so much content more than ever in some cases. And I would also argue in that same context, we're looking for more organic type content, right? We now can recognize a little bit more when it's not when it is and when it isn't. And when it isn't, you might be too, more in tune to turn away versus when it is, you start to develop that connection. So again, back to our audience, think about that organic, making sure that that content flows, making sure that that relationship sh shows that it's, it's real. And it's not just a, a, a paid for uh, type engagement. Um, but to switch gears, so we, we um, Radhika brought this up with artificial intelligence. I want to dive into the technology or innovations that's being brought into digital media that's creating some of these changes either now or looking at the future. You know, we've, again, Radhika mentioned AI. We've talked a little bit about data, but let's go above and beyond that. Um, Julian brought in blockchain and cryptographic um, added security and, and transparency a little bit as well. But what about augmented reality? What about virtual reality? What about these other areas of technology? Are they being brought in and maybe how are they being adopted or looked at being adopted in the coming future as investors are thinking about where to place their bets uh, in these categories? And Jonathan, let's start with you. Great. Um... I was just looking at something on my screen and kind of took away my attention. I, I hate to admit it, but uh, could you repeat the question? It's the cheddar biscuits at Rob Red Lobster. I'm with yeah, you. I'm, just, I'm like daydreaming. <laughs> I started salivating point. for a moment. <laughs> yeah. So, so what was the question again? <laughs> Whether or not you like cheddar biscuits? No. It is. You know, we're talking <laughs> about all these. We've talked about all this. These pieces that built up what's changing in digital media, but right. What about the underlying technologies and how are they being applied or, or looking at being applied like artificial intelligence, augmented reality, virtual reality, and others as we look towards the future of, of where digital media goes? Right. Well, I mean, right now, as far as virtual reality goes, unfortunately, there's a hardware problem. But, you know, there used to be a hardware problem when cable TV came out. You know, now everybody has at least two TVs, if not way more than that. So I think that'll all take care of itself. But in the meantime, you know, some of the bigger companies are investing more in virtual reality, I mean, and augmented reality and some of these other opportunities, but a lot of customers aren't really engaging with it. Maybe more my demographic, but outside of that, I, I really would have liked to see more progress. But I think with Facebook's upcoming plans, and then obviously PS5 is coming out, Virtual reality will be a big part of that. I think they did a pretty good job with PS4. Uh, we'll see more, but I, unfortunately, I can't say I have a whole lot of great, exciting examples, you know, for this moment. But we all know where it's going to go. Ryan, and we're unmuted. Um, I I'm excited about you know the idea of augmented reality. I mean, we're seeing it a little bit within even like an Amazon app where you can sort of put a piece that you want in your bedroom, see what the, you know, the nightstand's going to look like, look what that TV looks like up on your wall, um, where, you know, and, and obviously that can help with shopping, you know, decisions. They're also doing stuff where they're going to take a picture and they'll layer over and auto suggest like, oh, they think that this is this shirt and these pants, um, sort of shop the look. Um, and sort of to, you know, what Linwood was talking about, that type of technology in a live format could be really impactful. Um, and there's no reason to, you know, when, when the live is sort of staged, like an award show, they could pre-program all that stuff ahead of time where you could see the dress or you could even, you know, potentially buy the perfume that this person is wearing. Cause they're all complimenting, you know, so-and-so on the perfume. 
I think where it could potentially go is, you know, I was always fascinated with the um, second life game and the size of that economy. And I'm like, what's going on in there? And I never, I never went in there. I never heard, I never really delved into it too much, but the idea of having this sort of virtual uh, database of products where, you know, potentially we're like looking at a wall and it's just the Mona Lisa on our wall and we've purchased that through so-and-so, right? And, you know, digital versus physical products, I think it, it, it's pretty far out, but I, I'm, I'm excited to see where that goes. Right now, it, it, the actual things that I see that impact what we do day to day is you can take a picture of something and it'll put it in your room and you can buy it. So for now, it doesn't really have the, the, the adoption, but, you know, maybe in the future it will. Well, we're also seeing, uh, and I see you, Julian. I see you. <laughs> we're, 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 along with Linwood, we're, we're also seeing this with the rise of virtual events, right? You've got Fortnite awesome. that is hosting Travis Scott and, and many others uh, upcoming. Uh, you've got, I think, Wear VR that's hosting John Legend in a virtual co uh, concert where, you know, these things are taking place and advertisers are overlaying on them. Decentraland is another... Uh, use case similar to uh, uh, Second Life where these assets are being purchased lightly, to your point, it's still off, but um, there's a great report that was talking about this virtual economy that's being built and we've spoken about it on other episodes. That, I mean, right now people are making 25,000 to 200 plus thousand dollars a year selling on these types of goods. And when you bring in advertisers, when you bring audiences in, game on. Um, in, in so many ways. So you, you bring up a unique topic. Uh, Julian, I saw you throwing the hook out there. So I feel like you got a, a point more than just one because you're, you're giving us a hook. But <laughs> Linwood will come I'll, I'll to make you it, next. I'll make it brief. Yeah, I, I, I love this. I, uh, the analogy of the augmented reality, I think, can be applied to, the, um, to this vision I have, which is um, allowing the, the target, the advertisee, if you like, to be part of this uh, mix. Because it's almost like, as I said, the metaphor I gave, the magic glasses. It's allow, imagine a, a street full of silhouettes or a mall full of silhouettes. I put on my magic glasses, I can see the value of a complete stranger walking by. And I've got the, the ability to talk to them, to engage in what we call a dialogue. That could be everything from influ influencing the price of an advert to changing the price to simply chatting. And so um, I wanted to say, my perception of augmented reality is adding symmetry to augmented reality. Yeah, allowing the, the, the dialogue to be genuinely symmetrical, two-way. In our world, I can shout out. It's the reversal of spam. I'm loyal to myself, not a logo or a brand. That's Absolutely. It. I'll shut well, up. <laughs> no, no, it's perfect. I mean, you bring up another good point. In, back to Ryan's, is you have a physical and you have a digital self yeah right? exactly. we've talked about on previous episodes of vctv of the idea of digital identities and yes. multiple identities where you could be walking on the streets in in uh in london yeah going to find your favorite artist buying a physical <laughs> and a digital version but you can also have a digital avatar and that yeah. digital avatar has uh you know a nike shirt on whereas in the physical form yeah, exactly. Brandless. Exactly. exactly. Um, and and multiple, tons of different live, ways multiple live at any one time. Exactly. So, Linwood, we've hold, held you back. I'm letting you go. Go for it. Uh, just real quick, I think that that virtual reality, augmented reality world is going to do well in sports. Um, I think that's where NBA was ahead of, ahead of a lot of people uh, trying to sell virtual seats. Um, I played with the tech. It's kind of cool. Um, my wife's in fashion, and I always thought fashion should have led this charge um, uh, and, and retail should have. I mean, I, I've been pushing retail about seven years ago. I did a pitch to Macy's like the entire fleet should be turned into this um, mm -hmm. where you um, lessen the inventory in the actual store and focus on your new products and have your other inventory ready to be picked up, delivered, because that's the stuff you commonly buy. So pulling the entire database of what you have, pulling that in when I walk into the store, matching it with what's existing, and then giving me my own personal shopping using my own device, recogn recognition of me, and allows me to actually have an amazing shopping experience, which is why you go to the physical store anyway, instead of just buying from Amazon. 
right? And um, yeah. that is where I see the most opportunity. Um, yeah. And then we are using it more to like LiveX Live is a good platform that is doing live uh, concerts. And they were doing it before COVID, but it's obviously picked up. And that company's also acquired a bunch of podcasts. So they're really betting on this from a long-term f- future. And I work with them well um, as well. So that's, that's all I was going to say. There's multiple companies really focused on it. Yeah. And what you're bringing up is, is something that Jack Ma introduced called, uh, you know, O to O or online to offline. And the idea that you could begin shopping online, transition offline into the store, but that inventory uh, supply chain, if you will, is very different. It's very limited uh, in the store, whereas instead it's being pulled from large uh, warehouses, right? And I think here in the States, as we're looking at how logistics may be refactored coming forward, we may actually start to see that in Asia, uh, in, in specifically Southeast Asia, this is actually a trend that's starting to pop up. So if for, for those that are listening, if you're looking at uh, the online to offline retail markets, this is a huge, huge opportunity that has already been proven out throughout Asia and is starting to make its waves in various areas. But if you do start to look at this, look at the logistics and the warehouse, because that transition from online to offline, there's still some hiccups uh, if, if you don't have the right logistics process. In- Can I say one last thing? Um, yeah. On, on that side of it, um, for 10 years, I ran a company called New England Technology and we did B2B. And what we would do is when we bought excess inventory, we looked at our data to tell us that we knew that 80% of this product would sell in the West Coast versus on the East Coast. So our uh, warehousing and freight forwarding was all based on data. We've been using this now for you know almost 14 years. That was how we lit a warehouse and what we did. And when we were using Woot, we knew the average order, what size order, and what the where that would need it to be. So our overnight was usually shipped within 20 miles. And, you know, we understood all of that. It was built into our platform, into our systems. So our logistics was why we did so well. So to your point, Echo and your point, that's the key. Yeah. And it's for entrepreneurs that we've talked about this again around supply chain and logistics and what's changing as things become more hyper local. You have to pay attention to that supply chain. Take Lynn Wood's example and, and his experience at Woot. This is something you have to nail. And now being more localized, it's something you can absolutely capitalize on as well. And with that being said, I want—I got two more big, 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 big questions. And, and Julian, I will come back to you for, for that point as well. But uh, for, for all of you, uh, as, as Julian is answering this, his, his, uh, adding his thoughts, think about where are the investment opportunities right now? As investors or as builders, where do you see the opportunities for investors to start investing in these spaces around the future of digital media? And Julian, I know you had something to add on that. No, one. no. Let, 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 let's focus on your lovely big question. I can. My point was not important. All right, deal. I, all right, then. Uh, with that, Jonathan, let's start with you. Where is the opportunity as an investor to start investing in this space? Sure. So I'm going to bring up something that you said, and I really hope you can remember the term you used because I want to use that myself. I thought it was a great term that kind of turned the head, but it talked about data deterioration or somehow it it doesn't stick around. What was that term you used? Uh, Perishable data. There you go. So I think a lot of media and advertising is focused on like the now and then it perishes a lot of our strategies focus on how can you be in the right place at the right time. And it can go beyond just search engine optimization. Um, For instance, if you were to ticker tag your article to a major company, like we did one today uh, that ticker tags IBM. So if you go to IBM's news page, you'll see that there, it doesn't deteriorate nearly as quickly. And I think that's a metric that people really need to pay attention to because things are so volatile. So if you had a big campaign, plan for a day the stock market dropped 1800 points or maybe there's a, a new you know unfortunate story in civil unrest or, or whatever now it's gone you have to do it again um, but if you were to focus your advertising dollars and investment dollars in the advertising market 
um, on something with more staying power, you reduce your risk, you get more value out of it. So I would say pay attention to that metric as you're evaluating opportunity. Great point, Ryan. Yeah, I think I think the investment opportunity there there's sort of this now investment opportunity, and then there's six months from now, a year from now, vaccine comes out. You don't want to be overextended based on that happening or not happening. If you're looking at really trying to capitalize on the current sort of state of things, um, I go back to you know something I've heard where it's like, well, what are the things that you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, and then where do you align with sort of the mainstream? And you know, like you guys were talking about Spotify and their growth, and my Spotify consumption has gone up quite a bit. I listen to quite a bit of podcasts and my podcast behavior has changed instead of commuting because we went remote. Uh, now it's at home during workouts um, because I'm working out at home, not at a gym where they controlled the music. And so I think it's a, it, it's a sort of like pulling down and looking at like, what are the sort of fundamental behaviors that have changed? And then what are the ones that are going to stick around regardless of a vaccine coming out? Because I just think that, you know, like I was talking about Disneyland yesterday and, and they, they have an idea to, to reopen, but I'm, I'm assuming there's going to be some occupancy limitations in terms of how many people I was, I looked it up. It was like, they can, they, I think it was like 50,000 people a day they were putting in there. And if, if there's regulation now that says there's only 25,000 people that can come in and, and then on top of that, and there isn't by the way, but if, if there was, or if there's new occupancy limits of restaurants and things like that, it's like, what are these things that are going to stick around? And then beyond just the rules that come in place, what are the behaviors that people aren't just going to go back to? Because, you know, piling into a, a big old arena right now doesn't sound that appealing to me. Um, and how long will that take? Is that going to stick forever? I don't know. Um, and so to me right now, I'm just sort of watching um, and trying to be, you know, mindful um, of, you know, the fluidity that we're in. And I'm also not a very, yeah, uh, I, I don't have a huge risk tolerance. I'm pretty conservative when it comes to the risk. Although, although, I I, I joke that like my day job is my risk, and then the rest, my investments are the are this. I go for more safe things. So I'm sort of I'm sort of watching right now. Hey, that's smart. There's a ton happening and ton changing. That's not a not a bad decision either. Uh, as well, <laughs> uh, you know, joining panels like this allows to provide new perspectives. So it's a, it's a great uh, a great position to take by all means, Radika. Same question to you. I mean, you guys run a VC arm now that's global. Um, where are you thinking about placing bets or where are the opportunities for investment either locally in India or globally uh, as a whole and around digital media? I'll talk more about India. Um, so in India, I think there are two places where we can see a lot of uh, investment from, uh, especially which is related to my world and media. So one is the video creation. So while... <laughs> I mean, our behaviors are still shifting from print, radio, TV to mobile. I mean, we are a mobile first uh, country. So a lot of video, and that is the reason why TikTok suddenly came. There were many other small players in the market, but TikTok came and suddenly they have the largest number of subscribers from India because uh, they have made video creation easier and people, even average person looks good on video using a lot of small tools which were never thought of uh, for uh, about i mean thought of by youtube and even larger uh, me media players earlier so video is one space which is getting a lot of interest both from the content creator side from the companies like tiktok and even the handset manufacturers and placing videos on different screens whether it's lock screen whether it's in front of the browser whether in front of minus one screen there are a lot of formats and even your desktops and everywhere is uh, something where video is being seeing a lot of experimentation so that is one space but that coupled with ai and algorithms is what will work well so not just uh, content creation, but the content presentation uh, to the audience, because there, are a lot, there is a lot of content, there's no dearth of content. And there's a lot of, uh, I mean, we have a huge user base also. So I think these are two areas in media and advertising space where I am closely working with. We'll see uh, investments uh, in India uh, in small and large capacities both. Linwood, thank you, Radhika. Linwood. Um, I would say for for me, it's uh, looking for platforms or, you know, um, companies that can scale and who can tie that that entire supply chain of uh, that audience 
capture the audience, capture, tell them the right story, um, collect the data, be able to track the attribution and actually be able to bring a product through that captures that life cycle and is inside that cycle at some point. Um, I also see opportunistically that there's platforms out there or there's opportunities out there for, to acquire or built networks that have an audience that are, right, right now uh, need capital. And the third thing I'm seeing is a, um, a raising of capital uh, to support and to fund and properly fund a lot of black and people of color uh, um, startup and founders. Because I, you know, the, the, the one thing I can tell you for a fact that there's a lot of those companies are underfunded and because they're underfunded, their, the success rate goes down or, uh, and they do, they bootstrap things that are critical. And, and I think that support is something that's needed. So I've been invited to a bunch of uh, multiple uh, uh, companies that are investing that raise already and have the money in hand from anywhere from 100 million to 250 million already and are looking to start to, uh, their mandate has been fulfilled. So now they're starting to look to invest. That's great. And, and also is on that similar note, we, we also just saw the news yesterday that uh, CAA and uh, NEA, New, New Enterprise uh, Associates, uh, which is a firm based here in the Bay Area, we had one of their venture partners on a previous episode of BCTV, just came together to uh, put together a new venture fund uh, focused on uh, the media and entertainment space and investing uh, throughout that as well. So to Lynn Wynn's wow. point, there is, yeah, there's big, big news yesterday. Um, but uh, there's a ton happening in this space and there's a lot of capital, no matter who you are or where you're building, get out there, come to people like us uh, and others that we, we have here and get going and get building because it is a time to do so. And with that, Julian, uh, close us out in, in terms of where else uh, uh, we're seeing opportunities to be investing in. Yeah. Framing my response, my background, Apple, AT&T, Barclays, big companies, you know, I, 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 my job was to imagine things that had a long shelf life. I'm not the best person to, there are many business opportunities that can be valuable with valuable exits, which wouldn't meet my criteria. My criteria are what I would call is a business internet rules compatible? And what I mean by that is uh, the, the three things, free, open, global. Free means some aspect of it needs to be usable in the beginning. Open means that other parties can come on and enhance the core product. And global means that you could apply this wherever you were in the world and it would still work. And those are my, if you like, key metrics. As I say, thinking about at a high level for a big corporation, will, does something have a long shelf life? Um, but picking up on a couple of other things, you know, the internet doesn't value technology anymore. The building blocks are defined. It values community and it values operational excellence. Those are the things that are important. And some of the skills that have been spoken about by Linwood and others about how they've built their businesses. Those are the clever things. Technology is, it's a Lego building block. Do I build a duck, a chicken or a plane? You know, it's a function of imagination. So uh, have, have I answered the question? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I love it. And as, as we are here at the close of the top of the hour, almost, uh, let's, let's uh, go ahead and give our sign off. So Julian, where can everyone find you online, uh, the website of the company, yourself, et cetera, and then we'll come around to everybody else as we, we come to close. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, julian.wilson at uh, ecospend.com. And uh, uh, LinkedIn is uh, whatever it is. And thank you for the invitation. I hope to contribute in the future. Wonderful. Absolutely. And Radhika, uh, same to you, please. Where can everyone find you? Oh, you're on mute. Yeah. Uh, so uh, LinkedIn is the best place. I mean, email IDs might be tough to remember, but with the same name, it's, I, I, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. Yeah. Wonderful. Linwood. Uh, LinkedIn is perfect to find me. Um, and also you can go to reachtv.com. Um, and you can find me there, but you know, it's easy to find me. I'm, I'm pretty visible. I'm pretty active and visible. Wonderful. And, and make sure to tune in everybody as well. Uh, so Brian, <laughs> where can everyone find you? 
Yeah, link, LinkedIn's good. Uh, but my, my company's called Quiver on there. It won't. It, Forbes is part of it, but you'll see Quiver, so don't be confused if you want to reach out. <laughs> just, just reach out to Ryan. He's a good guy. He wants to talk. Just reach out to him. Don't worry about what it says. Just reach out to him. Forbes, Jonathan. Quiver. <laughs> it's all the same. It's a, don't, just, just reach out to the guy. Uh, Jonathan, where can everyone find you? Sure. LinkedIn would be great. There's only two Jonathan Kimes the way my name is spelled, so it won't be too hard to find me. And then you can also find us at InvestorBrandNetwork.com. And then the brand that we media sponsor with you is uh, CryptocurrencyWire.com. Wonderful. Everybody, thank you so, so very much for tuning in from around the world and giving all these insights uh, along with just your general knowledge on this space and where everything is shifting. Uh, to you, our audience, thank you for all the great questions. Thank you for tuning in. And to Elena and to the entire LA Token team for putting this together. I'm Kyle Ellicott, your host for VCTV. Looking forward to seeing you all back here tomorrow as we dive into one of my favorite topics, fintech and blockchain. Uh, until then... <laughs> Everybody have a great day. Julian, we may have you back for tomorrow. Don't